The columns of the Goetheanum, along with other parts of the building, are made of different kinds of wood. Now perhaps you are wondering why. If so, brace yourself for condemnation. Rudolf Steiner on July 5th, 1914. In the external present, in the present that knows nothing of the science of the spirit, there is, of course, as yet little understanding to be found for these deeper laws of all being and becoming. And you can even experience someone asking the question, quite understandable for an external kind of knowledge, so why are these columns made of different kinds of wood? Truly, nothing allegorical or symbolical is intended. And he who raises this question only signifies to us by the question that he never in his life had occasion to ponder deeper laws of the world. For one would have to give him the answer so why don't you consider it necessary to string a violin with all A strings? Just the same demand that someone would show by wanting only A strings on a violin is what he would show, perhaps quite unconsciously and cluelessly, who might want to ask, out of a superficial kind of knowledge, why the columns are made of different kinds of wood. So there's your answer. You wouldn't string a violin with four A strings, now would you? Come on, people! Also, Rudolf Steiner, the seven trees, those are the seven ways man can live out his being. This was spoken in 1905 before there was any talk of a Goetheanum, and without reference to any particular species of trees. Still, it's worth comparing these remarks to the seven columns, shown here from right to left. The rough transcript of March 27, 1905, continues, The Seven Trees those are the seven ways man can live out his being. We have there the past, the present, and the future of the being of man before us. We have, first, the physical sheath, sthula sharira, then the ether body, prana, in which the forces of reproduction, nutrition, and growth are at work. Thirdly, that part of the human being in which the drives and passions hold sway, the astral body. And only then, as the central member, the fourth, human self-awareness. Man has received his fourfoldness unconsciously, without any contribution of his own. As soon as he has received self-awareness, he begins to work on himself and to organize his astral body. He thereby gradually irradiates his astral body from within. This work will be concluded at the end of our post-Atlantean epoch. Then the astral body will be permeated with manas. There are seven stages. First, the tree of existence, where man develops his physical body. Second, the tree of growth. Third, the tree of relation, where man develops sympathy and antipathy for the surroundings. Fourth, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil 
where man closes himself off from the outer world. Fifth, the tree of life, where man begins to enliven his astral body. That is the transition from the Kama body to Manas. Sixth, the tree of the word, where man is in a position to perceive the so-called inner word, where he has mystic recognition. Seventh, the tree of divine bliss, when man rests in the divine bliss of the all. As Hilde Raske points out, the light of the colored windows shone on the woods of different colors and filled the hall. The brown oak or the light shimmering birch answered differently when the peach blossom or the violet light fell on them. The columns in the auditorium were made of these woods, beginning with hornbeam in the west. The first and last are lightest, those in the middle are darkest. Hornbeam and birch belong to the same family. Hornbeam wood is clear and extraordinarily hard. It used to be used to make mechanical parts such as cog wheels or things like knives. It burns nearly as hot as coal. Like all substances, it is the congealed result of a process namely of a tree with the formative principle of root sinews running right up its trunk. Roots spreading horizontally far beyond the reach of the above ground tree can sprout new trees. The dense foliage forms mass Hornbeam can be cut and woven into hedges, which in the past extended across whole regions as military fortifications. Ashwood was favored for ray-like instruments such as rake handles and spears. It has a flowing grain. The tree rises tall and slender and lets the sunlight in between its pinnate leaves. Branch and leaf are ray-like as well. In autumn it generates oil. The leaves stay mostly green until they fall. Cherry wood has depth of feeling and a reddish blush. It arises from a process of beauty. The fragrance of the blossom, the sweetness of the fruit, the bittersweet kernel, they resonate with the soul and draw the insects and birds. There are even nectaries at the base of the leaf. The cherry tree has inspired poetry, song, and painting. The wood, too, is beautiful and exudes a fragrance like almond. Oak wood has a jammed grain. It is heavy, dense, and immune to decay. It was used to build ships and the piers of bridges being impervious to water for centuries. And also because the branches don't break off, so you get prefabricated unbreakable joints. It arises from a tenacious process. 
the tree can live for hundreds of years. A freestanding oak takes 40 or 50 years to bear acorns. In the forest, it takes 50 to 80 years. Only late in spring do the leaves burst forth, and after they die, they often hang on deep into winter. Their shape speaks of a wrestling of inner and outer forces. So does the acorn, with its polarity of kernel and cap. So do the gnarled branches. The branching changes direction abruptly. The strongly rooted oak connects with its place and persists there, for the acorn falls straight down. Its shapes resonate with strength of character, and there are famous individual oak trees. Elmwood is conspicuous for its gorgeous curves, pervaded by vessels. The tree grows deep, but is also quick to put its exceptionally light seeds to flight. They ripen even before the leaves come out, and remain viable for only a few days. The asymmetrical leaf form, in graceful curves, shows unusually great variation from leaf to leaf. The trunk tends to fork. In one species, even the branchlets grow wings. Maple wood carries tone well and is often used for musical instruments. The tree bears a fullness of leaves in a harmonious overall shape. Each leaf shows a wholeness, with currents spreading in all directions. Birch wood often has a satiny sheen. The tree grows shallow roots. It is always young, with an affinity to light, air, and water. Its small moving leaves do not face the light so much as they swim in it. Even the bark is full of light. At the Munich Congress, when the occult columns were only just beginning to incarnate, they had no bases. In Malsch, each base simply repeats the lower part of its capital. In the Goetheanum, the bases have forms of their own. In the capital of a column, the load from above is gathered, and the support from below is opened. In the base, the load from above is distributed, and the support is gathered. The first four stages ascend. The fourth culminates in reaching the top. The last four descend. The middle stage can be felt as ascending or descending. As in the capitals, each figure appears seven times around the prism of the base. The lower part of the first base is at first an arrhythmic exception. Then in the second, it fuses with the upper form and is taken hold of by the rhythm of the seven-faced prism. It forms a point at each edge of the prism. Just when this coalescence is becoming massive, a switch from face to edge brings clarity and differentiation.
from the third base to the fourth, the formative forces of the edges further shape the upper forms. On the faces, the lower forms join and swell. The undulating form concentrates its force at the crests. It will ascend, becoming the laterally connected form in the fifth base. The kink in the upper form of the fourth shows its tendency to contract. It becomes the single form in the fifth. Now it dwindles on the edge. Just when it is about to vanish, the switch from edge to face expands it. The connected form, on the other hand, shifts to the edge and detaches. You can still just about make out its split lower end in the sixth base as a vestige of the forking in the fifth. Here are the sixth and seventh bases. In the sixth, the smaller forms on the faces are already detached from the top and have begun their descent. They will reach the bottom first and form the lower element in the seventh base. The larger forms of the sixth base on the edges, only detach and begin to descend in the seventh. In the first four stages, the motif generates forms that gradually gastrolate, creating an inner space. The last three tend to be negatives of the first three to the surprise of Rudolf Steiner, who only noticed this afterward. From west to east, here from right to left, the capital motif begins with a vertical tendency and ends in horizontal connection as the architectural supporting force is opened more and more. The base motif becomes increasingly vertical as the supporting force is gathered. Face and edge switch before the third base and after the fifth. In the middle three, what has shifted to the edge narrows, in keeping with the principle mentioned last time. Then in the last two, it broadens having shifted back to the face, whereas what has now shifted to the edge narrows. In the last, the vertical form is open at the lower end. It comes from the larger form in the sixth, whose split lower end, as mentioned, is a remnant of the sideways branches in the fifth. Thus the first four open upward, the last four downward. The whole series 
passes through a true metamorphosis. What in the last stage is above was below in the first. That which begins above and ends below, shown here in blue, tends to be rounder. That which begins below and ends above, here red, sharper. It ends above in the seventh stage, but tending downward, toward its original position again. Using the general principle shown last time for the seal versions of the capitals, Karl Kemper created seals corresponding to the bases. Here are his woodcuts, arranged. 